The Birmingham Civil Rights Institute is charged with the idea of taking the lessons from the past and transferring them to our future. As stewards of history in the Birmingham movement, the BCRI houses incredible collections that show and document where the community has come from and how the Birmingham movement both came to be and was so successful. For more than 25 years, the Institute has educated people about what happened here in the 60s, not just in Birmingham, but across our country. Civil rights and equality challenge today just as they were many decades ago. We are here to enlighten each generation about civil and human rights by exploring our common paths and working together in the present to build a better future. Through many educational offerings, we teach the idea that the changes in Birmingham, Alabama were not just because of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and Reverend Ralph Abernathy. A lot of these changes took place because of the youth in the city. And due to that, we have a mission to share with the youth of today what youth in their generations in the past have done. Through our Legacy Youth Leadership Program, we bring high school students from all over the Jefferson County area here to study this narrative and to serve as docents and ambassadors to the Civil Rights Institute. We have BCAP, which is the Birmingham Cultural Alliance Project, where we visit middle school students and we take them through this history and through this narrative so that they can prepare to understand their role in society. We have outreach programs that visit many schools and institutions to highlight the story of accomplishment, the story of overcoming, the story of a power and the movement that people in Birmingham were able to bring to bear to change not only the city, but the state, the nation, and the world. By making it accessible to researchers and local students from middle, high, and university students, they're able to come in and see where we've been so that they can go and be better stewards of Birmingham and our present and then our future. Thank you for joining us for this engaging virtual conversation series. We invite you to help us continue the work for civil rights through racial justice by becoming a member or donating to our work. You can find us on our social media platforms to stay connected with us. Thanks again for your support. Greetings. I am Charles Woods III and I am the Education Programs Manager here at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. And we want to welcome you to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's virtual conversation series called Arts and Archives. And today we are excited to welcome you to this conversation where we are talking about the signs of segregation. Here at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, we want to foster dialogue and conversation about difficult issues and topics and provide a space to have these discussions. Thank you for joining us today. And now we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, today we have two dynamic individuals who are representing two of Alabama's historic black colleges and universities today to um, accompany me with this discussion about the signs of segregation. And so first I wanna introduce uh, Dr. Kwasi Daniels. Kwasi, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Daniels, could you briefly introduce yourself? Tell us what you're doing, um, what you're interested in, and um, why you, you agreed to, to do this conversation today. <laughs> Uh, good uh, good morning, or, or I guess it's uh, afternoon now. It just crossed over, right? I'm Dr. Kwesi Daniels. I'm the department head of architecture at Tuskegee University. And uh, at Tuskegee, one of the things that we've been focusing on is the celebration of our spaces. As the uh, When I found out about this opportunity, I was like, this would be a great time for us to really look at the ways that architecture and art and imagery continue to permeate. Uh, we've been looking at that within our program to create a segregated society. 
Uh, and this is probably one of the things that's not discussed enough. Um, however, there are still many vestiges that continue to persist. And so um, interested in, in, in being here so we can talk about the work that we do at Tuskegee and also talk about the work of, um, you know, making real change from many of the spaces that we've grown up in. Well, thank you. Um, also, we have Dr. White representing Alabama State University. Dr. White, can you please introduce yourself? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and why you agreed to do this conversation today. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Robert White, and I'm actually from Tuskegee University. I was born on the campus uh, of John Andrew Hospital. My mom went to Tuskegee. My dad went to Fisk, and my dad was a biochemist at the VA hospital out there, and my mom was a freshman at Tuskegee, and he saw her walking down the street, and the rest was history. <laughs> 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 so I grew up on the campus and know all the ins and outs of all of those buildings and uh, have, have just uh, made my, my rounds there. I went to, went to college there for two years. And while I was at Tuskegee, I majored in girls and basketball and partying. And I, y'all, I had to stop. I, had to, I don't even remember. <laughs> most, of, most, of, most of my time at Tuskegee. And so uh, I had an athletic scholarship, an academic scholarship there. And man, I, I couldn't, I couldn't hit a basket. I couldn't, I mean, I, I just saw the pretty girls there and everything. I just lost my mind, you know? And so I had to make a change. Now my daughter is about to graduate from Tuskegee. And so, uh, I'm excited about that, but I've taught at Alabama state university for, uh, 25 years. I was in-house legal counsel for the Alabama Education Association. I did that for a year and I managed the elections division for the state of Alabama. I did that for, uh, on an interim basis. I did that for two years, written books on the subject. Uh, I lecture all over the country on the subject. Um, mostly I deal with uh, middle school, elementary school, you know, uh, talking with them and so forth. Every now and then they'll let me talk to some, you know, uh, some scholars and, and that type of stuff, but I'm, I'm kind of like the one that, you know, that, um, uh, they make me eat in the kitchen when company come because I like to bring up a lot of things. I like to bring up a lot of things that people don't want to talk about, you know? And well, so I'm whatever. shocked. At the, yeah. I'm shocked that the no. Institute let me talk because I spoke at the uh, Martin Luther King, uh, birthday, uh, celebration a couple of years ago. And I didn't think I was going to be ever invited back to <laughs> Jefferson County. Well, well we so, thank you. We thank you for, for being with us today. Uh, while, we, while we're just kind of shouting out HBCUs and everything, I want to shout out mine. I'm a graduate from Xavier University of Louisiana. Uh, Man, sorry New to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, huh? we didn't have a basketball team. So, <laughs> um, but no, uh, so we, we're going to keep rolling um, with this conversation today, talking about the signs of segregation. And these signs that we know, um, Alabama has a very strong history with this type of um, subject. One of the first states with reconstruction to institute black codes into their um, constitution. Um, and so when you're dealing with the signs of segregation, these were constant reminders for uh, black people and then other people of color, because we, we don't always want to make it seem like black people were the only ones that were subject to these type of things. But um, we were we were the main targets. But um, it really kept black people kind of um, a visual representation of the place that, that they were in in this society. Um, it was a visual representation of the second class or third class citizenship that African-Americans were receiving in this country. And Birmingham was notorious, notorious uh, for their racial ordinances and, 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 and segregation ordinances. And so um, one of the questions that I have is, is phrased a little funny, but um, I know you all will follow me. So we the society that we live in now is not the type of society where, you know, as three young black men we can't go into any bathroom you know and use the restroom when we choose to or drink from any drinking fountain but can you give an understanding to those who are who are listening and watching of what it was like to live in the segregated south dr white we'll, we'll go ahead and start with okay. you Numa. well well basically what you have is you you have uh a, a a testimonial that says something like well uh, we didn't even know that there was a segregation. We didn't even know, you know, that these things were going on. You know, all we did was hang in our little area and, um, you know, we had our our communities were sustained and those types of things. But what you had was you had 
very distinct boundaries of social interaction, right? And we have to distinguish between uh, social interaction in a private sector versus a public sector, right? Because the more or the greater the chances of whites and blacks interacting together on a, at a social level in the public, mm -hmm the more stringent the laws limiting and outlining what that behavior could be, right? So you would have, you would have strict enforcement uh, of blacks go here, whites go there uh, type of signage and laws in place on buses, in eateries, uh, in uh, uh, anywhere, in courthouses, those type things, anywhere where blacks and whites were forced uh, to interact with each other. And so those codes, uh, the Jim Crow laws actually emerged from the slave code or the codes Neor, and which were codes that uh, restricted conduct. You know, Afri uh, as slaves and African people, you know, could not look white men in the eye. They had to step into the street when whites would walk down the uh, mm. thing. They had to, uh, they couldn't, uh, you know, make any kind of demands or any type of, of statements of assertiveness and so forth. So those things play out not only habitually, you know, in the way people behave, but psychologically, right? It takes a psychological toll on people to the point to where they don't even feel uh, that they deserve or have a right to these things, right? Or have a right to sit uh, where white people sit or to go to a school that white people go to, you know, or to sit on a bus you know, uh, or any form of public transportation, uh, you know, like white people do to be uh, to live in the same neighborhood, you know, as white people. So you had signs that were reflective of laws, but those laws were reflective of a psychological predisposition that both black people and white people had about how blacks and whites were supposed to interact with each other in areas where uh, social interaction was very high. Now you have to contrast that with the way whites and blacks would interact with each other in the privacy of their own homes, which sometimes was totally different. So you would have blacks, you know, you would have a, a, a black maid or a black, you know, worker, maybe even integrated somewhat into a family mm -hmm. to where there might not have been. But when they went out in public, that black person could not interact with that white family like the way that they did in their own homes. So uh, understanding that who can flip a switch on and off like that psychologically, you know, and, and that's where you get a lot of the psychological problems that we have now, uh, even now, because of the psychological trauma uh, that those differences cause. Let me let me, let me cut you off there, Dr. White, just a little bit, because you already kind of segued into our next question. But oh, I want to give Dr. Daniels an opportunity. No, that's fine, because this, this is going to flow like this. Um, but I want to give Dr. Daniels an opportunity to weigh in on that. I did not ask you, Dr. Daniels, were you originally from the South? Um, for, from the Alabama area. Person like me, I'm from out west where things were totally different. And one other thing I wanted to mention is that I want people to get um, the idea that we're kind of, you know, picking on the South or, or you know, pointing fingers because we know that segregation was throughout this country um, and still is very much so in, um, in, in many areas. You know, in the North, you had the uh, de facto, you know, in, in the South, you had the jury. Uh, de facto was kind of like what you said, Dr. White, where, where black people just kind of knew their place. They knew that in Chicago, I'm not going to that side of town because I'm going to get hassled, harassed, or I shouldn't be there, or in New York or some of these other big cities. California was like that. Uh, Los Angeles was like that. And so I just want to give Dr. Daniels an opportunity to kind of weigh in on your understanding of what it was like um, for blacks living in the South. And then we're going to we're going to segue into um the 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 psychological um re residual effects of what that does to you mentally kind of like what dr white was talking about so uh dr dennis what do you think about what it was like to live in the south uh in the segregated south so um you know great question i'm, I'm originally from new jersey okay uh, we're coming out of the northeast there's um the conversation of what you hear of how it was but also my family was all from the south so my grandmother was from um, Columbus, Texas, and my grandfather was from Louisville, Kentucky. And my grandfather, my, my father would share stories about, you know, growing up in the South, to, you know, growing up in the North, visiting his family in the South in, in Kentucky and seeing the signs of segregation that said that you are not allowed to be here. Um, and I, so I think one of the things that's important to realize is that we're talking about a social construct. 
when we talk about racism as a term and we we share about how racism is this social construct, it's these signs and these images that allow for this construction of society. Exactly. With this image here, we can see you have a white uh, water fountain and the colored water fountain. The placement of them, the type, the quality. One is rusted while one is looks like it's wiped down every day. One, you know, is it, it you know the the size of it, the fact that you're hiding the the, the structure and the the plumbing underneath it uh, with the white water fountain, but for the black one, you're not. These social constructs are what continue to exist, and what uh, Dr. White was stating about how this uh, how different it was inside the house versus when you leave. That sense of public versus private, um, you know, servant and served quarters. I mean, when we look at uh, servants within a home, there's still that structure, that hierarchy. But because you have a place, you're the maid, right? Um, when you come out, that place is not there unless we establish that. And that's established through the signage or the quality of the spaces that you're going to inhabit. And just to continue to add to that, when 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 I look at my family, and I was just talking about this the other day, how I got to the Northeast or how my family got to the Northeast, it was because of this necessity to maintain this segregated environment through signage. And, and, and signage is not always the words, right? You know, a lynched body hanging from a tree is signage. It's, it's imagery. It's this message that I'm passing to the world so that you understand what your place is. You know, um, the, uh, I think his name was Thurman or, um, the, he was a past uh, senator from South Carolina, uh, one of the major investors in, in, in Clemson University. When Booker T. Washington visited the White House to have dinner, he stated that we're going to have to lynch 100 niggas in order to put them back in their place. I mean, this understanding of the place, right? You know, he didn't say that we had to kill them. You know, he didn't say we had to kind of sit them down and say, you know, you shouldn't have done that. He said, no, we have to lynch them. And it's and, and talking about the masses so that we can demonstrate the place that you have, so that you understand that you have not arrived to the same level as where I am, because we have to put more imagery out there. And so when you see the signs that say, um, you know, this is for colored only, and this is for white only, all of that is about demonstrating social hierarchy and helping you understand that in this social hierarchy, white is on top and black is on the bottom. And Whenever we blur those boundaries, we have to do things in order to reestablish that order. And and I know we're going to talk about how some of that continues to persist. Right. And, and, you, and you segue right into that. Um, and so we know that the black codes, Jim Crow laws, even apartheid in South Africa were tools of white supremacy um, used to basically try to or attempt to try to create a caste system, especially in the United States, where you just said where blacks were at the bottom, whites were at the top. Um, everything for blacks were restricted in some kind of way. You didn't have free movement or free um, navigation to go wherever you wanted to go. Whereas whites, you know, at the top, they had all of the freedoms that the nation allowed it. And so um, and then, Dr. White, you talked about a little bit about having to step off the curve. You know, these things that were um, sometimes unwritten in Birmingham, some of them were written. But a lot of times unwritten rules or laws that black people had to function in just to stay in their place. Um, and it was just an everyday life thing. So some some people didn't even recognize it. You know, other other people um, were stunt fighters against it, at, you know, at, at, at every turn. Um, but the question I wanted to ask is that how does living in surroundings that constantly remind you of your second class citizenship or third class citizenship affect you mentally? And then today, what do you think are some of those residual effects um, of that mental trauma that was never treated, um, that was passed down uh, generationally through you know, to your children and their children's children. Um, and we see a lot of those residual um, traumatic um, events that black people have endured throughout the time that they've been in this country um, coming to a head, you know, in, in modern times. Um, and then not, not only for, you know, black mental health and things of that nature, but also the same things that we're seeing with these police officers and, and, and unarmed black men being killed. A lot of that is the same idea, Dr. White, that you talked about, about being in a place and about these individuals staying in a, in a particular zone, a particular box, a particular place, um, not being able to exercise their rights or other things of that nature. So what do you all think um, living in that type of society affects one mentally? And then also, what are some of those residual effects that we're still seeing played out today? Dr. Daniels, I'm going to go ahead and start with you this time. That's OK. 
Oh, okay. yes. So, I mean, if we think about, you know, let's let's take an, an example of what I just saw yesterday um, in Minnesota. Wow. <laughs> or maybe it wasn't Minnesota, but it was, well, we had the young man who was killed in Minnesota, but there was a young man, um, uh, DeAndre. It wasn't Minnesota. I forget the suburb. It will come to me. But as a young man who there was a, a, a military police, a military um, soldier in their in this subdivision. And he's telling this young man, you have to go because you don't live here. But the young man lives there. Well, the residual is that we have to understand how is it that this white man can say this to this young black man? And it's believed that he's in his wrong place. The residuals are that it's actually not residual. The structures were all were put in place. The suburbs were put in place to maintain that condition of, of segregation, housing segregation. And so between the 1940s and the 1950s, through housing policy, we were able to establish this segregated, maintain this segregated society. So while we thought that there were changes and you know, with the 1960s and the civil rights movement, we thought there was changes because we saw certain signs coming down, the structure was already put in place such that you can say in 2020, get out of my neighborhood, even though I live in this neighborhood, I don't belong in this neighborhood. We can see that with Trayvon Martin. You know, even though I live in this neighborhood, exactly. Even though I live in this neighborhood, you're telling me get out of my neighborhood that I live in because this space through policy, it stated that blacks, black people were not allowed in this environment. And that was, in, that was, that was, that was uh, uh, institutionalized and cemented through something as simple as the deed restriction. You know, you had, you had covenants that stated you couldn't sell this land to a black person. Your zoning had to say that black people couldn't come in here and you cannot get a loan in order to do that. So we're not really talking about residuals. We're talking about the, the evidence of what was put in place with them. We're seeing how it continues to be demonstrated as we do what? Move into spaces and demonstrate that the, we are breaking down this hierarchy and they're saying, no, we need to place that, put that hierarchy back in place today. Man, that was that was some powerful stuff right there. Dr. White, what do you, what do you have to yeah. say on that? On that well, question? you got to understand that for the most part, as stated by Dr. Bobby Wright, who was a, a psychologist that we really need to know, white people are psychopaths. And when you're, de when you're dealing with a bunch of psychopaths, See, we try to figure this stuff out logical and reasonably, and you can't. You know, this is not, and I quote Ayn Rand, uh, who wrote Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and whatever. Uh, white supremacy is illogical, unreasonable, unscientific, savage, barbaric, unchristian, anti-capitalist, anti-colonial. It, it's anti-everything. And so we try to approach it from a logical and reasonable standpoint, and we can't. And so understanding the nature of the condition and the psychological trauma that these things have caused in our experience, regardless of whether we're in the North or the South are pretty much consistent. Uh, Dr. Daniels, I'm related to half of New York. <laughs> Me and you might be related. I went, up to, I went up to Brooklyn and hung out with my cousins in Brownsville and shoot, it was like I was, you know, back home, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the thing was, was that they were fighting white folks up there just like we were fighting white folks in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we talk about the merger of the activism and the classroom, right? We have to go to Oakland, California at Merritt College where the Black Panther Party took on a uh, an extended identity from the Lowndes County Freedom Organization from which the Black Panther Party in Oakland emerged. So we have a unified experience and that's what gives credence to pan-africanism because the the fact that white people are at the top and black people are at the bottom that's a global situation yes there's yes. not a place on this earth where you can go including africa where white people are not at the top and and black people are at the bottom fighting each other over skin complexion you know <laughs> over who's better the light or the dark so you got the light and the dark fighting each other but then there's a glass ceiling to where it is instituted as it was in Soweto, as it was 
uh, in in Alabama and Selma and Birmingham with violence, mm -hmm. right? When yes. we talk about France for non wretched of the earth, black skin, white mass. See, all of this is about the psychological trauma caused by something that's illogical and re unreasonable, but very violent. Yes. You know, yes. and it was the violence that we, you know, that that was the 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 main incident because nobody's going to accept inferiority from somebody without them pointing a gun at you. You know, nobody's going to sit there and 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 even then fight black black folk have always fought the cops. We've always done it. We're going to keep doing it. It's, it's kind of fun. But at the same time, uh, we fight the police because the police have always been a representation, a vanguard for white supremacy. And you think about it, the most uh, um, uh, most notorious names in Southern Jim Crow culture, uh, Jim Clark and uh, Bull Connor. See, all of these people mm -hmm. were police chiefs and sheriffs because in the South, this is what would happen. You would have, when you would have cases to where there would be uh, uh, protest marches, even of the smallest sort, like with the George Floyd thing, it was five Africans standing out there on the corner and they talking about crowd control. Five of them. And they, oh, we got to watch the crowd. We got to, we were scared about, did y'all see them poor folks standing out there? But see, <laughs> <laughs> what, what could they have? Them joker couldn't have done nothing. They were just standing there. But the point is, is that in those times, this is what white folk would do in the South, right? And they do this in the North too. Mm -hmm. They would mm -hmm. take state military action Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And give the authority to a local police chief to control all of it. Mm -hmm. You see, so what you have is you have whenever black folk cut up, you have a green light for a totalitarian state to come to come into play. Right. To where blacks civil rights and constitutional rights could be violated at will because you go into a martial law type situation and that goes back to Nat Turner, Denmark, Bessie, Gabriel Prosser, Madison, Washington, and all of the other hell raisers during slavery time that by simply organizing, right? Anything, anytime Negroes start to organize, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so the, the laws in place to where you couldn't congregate, you know, more than five Negroes, couldn't stand on a street corner. Uh, that's where you get loitering from. You know, that's where you get all, all of those, you know, all loitering is, is hanging around and you don't have a job. And mm -hmm. that's what that's what the Floyd situation was, the Michael Brown, the Eric Garner. See, all them Negroes ain't had no job. And they were hanging out. So that those laws go back to, I don't know if y'all know, but it was illegal in the state of Alabama for a Negro not to have a job. Did y'all know that? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's something, isn't it? But you dealing, yeah, yeah, vagrancy. So you're dealing with all of these, but it is to have a psychological effect, you see? But you got to understand this. You are dealing with a bunch of psychopaths. And, and that is scientific. You look at Dr. Nellie Fuller, uh, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson. Uh, there's a book called Black Rage with uh, Cobb and Greer. Uh, we can even go across the water. Basil Davidson, African genius. Anything by Franz Fanon is, is good. But all of that sums up the fact that these folks are crazy and you cannot confront crazy with logic. You see, so let me you, ask you, you let me, Dr. White, let me cut you off really quickly. Um, and so I want to ask because you're 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 you're, you're kind of touching on what our next question is about. Um and and you're saying it in a general sense, but but we may but we may need to get a little more specific, um, in the sense that we've seen what apartheid looked like in South Africa. We know that Hitler used what was going on with Jim Crow laws and, and, and the things that were going on in the United States as his basis for the Nuremberg laws and how he treated the Jews in, in Germany. So why do you think the, the, the discrimination in the, in the United States got to such great lengths? Um, and do you feel it could ever get to that level again? Why do you think it was so important for them to have these black codes and these and these Jim Crow laws and these segregated signs and and all of these things that we we kind of touching it on it and, and 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 alluding to it a little bit? And then, do you ever think it could get to that level again? I mean, the, the, I mean, listen. Yeah, I think it is getting to that level again. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, if you if go you, ahead, brother, if you, if go, you realize go. that what we're talking about are 
conditions to maintain social distance between the races. When black folks were brought over as chattel, they were put there and put in a certain place. It was not for us to congregate and all of us come together. It was, this is where you belong. And I would argue that you can find many of these things still prevalent today. I mean, if you go to any major city, I, I studied in Newark, I studied in, 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 in Philadelphia, lived in both cities. The, 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 the quality of militarization that, is, that runs rampant in these environments in order to maintain uh, the, the, the segregation between the races is real. Look at the look at the quality of education. I mean, I'm in Montgomery. Charter schools are are are, are not you know the the savior. You know they're the baseline, hmm. but they're put in place in spaces where the public school system is so horrendous because we know it does not train me to be a contributing member of society because that's not his goal. And you can trace who is going to be able to be funneled based on their zip code. Right. If you look at a certain zip code, you can't move out of that zip code. Wow. And that means that anything that I want to do to put inside you, if, you know, whether it's the food, whether it's the education, whether it's the criminalization, whether it, you know, whether it's the lack of resources, that is placed there based off your zip codes. I mean, so this is not something that is it doesn't exist. It still exists today. You know, when 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 I was in uh, I was looking at Philadelphia and some of the challenges they were facing in the 60s and 70s, uh, Frank Rizzo, who during the Black Lives Matter, his 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 uh, statue was one of the statues that was pulled down. Why is this statue pulled down? The man would pick up black black kids from one neighborhood and he would call them turf drops. Where I drop you from, I take you out of one neighborhood and I drop you in another neighborhood because um, I, we don't want to deal with you. When it came to dealing with the Black Panther Party, they 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 came together and organized that they were raided each one of the offices and they stripped them in front of the television and then they shot guns in, 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 their, in their ears just to make sure that they took their clothes off so they could be stripped naked in front of the in front of the world to demonstrate the position you're supposed to play, you're, you're you're supposed to take. The move movement, you know, move, not a movement, move. If you look at MOVE and the fact that you, this is this is one of two times in this country where the government bombed you. One was Tulsa, Oklahoma. The second was Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yep. And you drop a bomb and it's a black community that's, that's decimated as a result of it. And, and that community is still dealing with the, the vestiges of it. So when we look at these conditions, this is stuff that continues to permeate throughout our society. And it's these are, these are not... Um, uh, you know, this is not like the crumbs that are left over. You know, there's, you know, people literally are baking more cakes of racism. And we see that come through in, you know, 20 years later. It's just that we now understand we have the evidence of how it's taken place. But this stuff continues to work. That's why we have to be very, very vigilant about protecting our community, be very vigilant about how we prepare ourselves for the work that's coming down. Because when you look at stuff like this happened to, to you know to Floyd, what you see with Trayvon, what you see with Tamir Rice, I mean, the only difference between now and before is we got some body cameras to show it, or people have cell phones to show what's been going on. So this is nothing new, you know. And we need, and honestly, we need to stop acting like it's new. This is all old. It's all on re on repeat. You know, we just have to continue to do the work that we're supposed to be doing, so that we can, you know, we can keep the fight going. Doctor White, what you, what you think? Yeah, well, I think that, see, you, you have to ask an epistemological question. That's what Dr. Uh, Eubanks at Tuskegee, the philosophy teacher that actually inspired uh, the Tuskegee Advancement League who joined SNCC, uh, you know, to, uh, you got to ask the epistemological question. What role does knowledge play in the, in the, in the evolution of a people? Mm -hmm. You know, we're still an evolving people. But what role is knowledge play? Because all this stuff we talk about, man, do you know I talk about this stuff every day? Me too. Every day, all day, in my sleep. You know what I'm saying? Kids be calling all hours of the night, want a lecture and stuff. I don't have time for all that. But, you know, we, we, we done talked about this stuff ad nauseum. We can't talk about LeBron no more. We can't talk about, we got to talk about this stuff all the time. But we told you so. I mean, you know, 
a lot of the stuff that we see on television, the, the people that are asking questions and doing the talking, I mean, we should have talked about this stuff 20 years ago. So we could move to action. But you got a bunch of Negroes running stuff now that's not interested in action. They're interested in a show, you see? So if I'm talking about Robert Sabukwe or Chris Honey, or I'm talking about Steve Biko, or you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about some real freedom fighters, and then we gotta go and 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 talk about some nonsense, you know, uh uh you know, here in America. I mean, you know, it just lets me know that we're not serious. You know, we you got a lot of Negroes in positions that are are propped up by the very institution that we're trying to get rid of. Which means that when we get knowledge of self, when we get knowledge of just the facts of what happened, the first order of business is to disqualify these Negroes from being able to tell us anything. You see, and I'm serious, is that when this knowledge comes forth and it's revolutionary in nature, which means that it's going to inspire people to step outside their comfort zone. You see, you have an education out there. Carter G. Woodson talked about it, the miseducation of Negro. You have an education that only keeps some people in their place. They only concern with tenure. They only concern with a position at the university. They only concern with, and they're not, they're not interested in challenging status quo. They're not interested in putting the information out there. And so, you know, my half alma mater, Tuskegee, people say, they say stuff like this. They say, well, I want my kid to go to HBCU so they can get a black experience. Well, hell, what did you have before that? <laughs> You had a black experience before that, didn't you? And what did that do? Right. <laughs> you see, it is <laughs> people had this misconception, and I mean, I've been, to, I, I know this. You know, they have a misconception that just because you go to HBCU, you're gonna be equipped with the tools to fight white supremacy, and that's not true. We have to have a curriculum set up, right, that teaches the science of self governance, the science of economics, the science. To the point to where we can logically and reasonably, you know, face the issues uh, that emerge. At Tuskegee, for me, it was Dr. Tolan, right? It was Dr. Fluker. You see what I'm saying? It was Dr. Woodson. See, but these are individuals, right? Who <laughs> caught hell from the school trying to teach this. I mean, you see what I'm saying? And so, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, because I think you raise a great point, and um, that's where, if we look at a Tuskegee, and you look at the foundation of Tuskegee, and you look at the role that Booker T. Washington played at Tuskegee, the aim this he his goal was to use education as a way to fight white supremacy. The understanding that if I train up the community to be self empowered, then we can. Build and the and the and the intelligence of it and, and Birmingham knows this. I mean, the amount of churches and communities that got that that have dealt with fire, you know, because you didn't like it. But you come to Tuskegee and not only did we make our own buildings, but we made our own bricks. That wasn't just because I think it's cute. It was y'all like, still well, making bricks, brother. <laughs> yeah, listen. <laughs> you know, if, if, first of all, if, if I can dig in the ground and I can turn that soil into a brick. And that brick can go in the fire and it, and it comes out the fire. Then you're talking about, you know, fire knows fire. So, you know, you don't have to meet me with something else. And that's what made Tuskegee powerful. And that's what made its architects powerful. When you look at 16 Baptist, 16th Street Baptist Church, you know, you had to bomb that thing in order to take it down. Well, you know, Wallace Rayfield learned the knowledge of how to build of that to that level because he was building buildings on Tuskegee's campus and all these buildings are fortresses. You understand that if I'm bringing education to the masses, I have to do it in a way that I can resist the immediacy of fire. You know, hmm. you can come up and you try to burn me. You know, timber burns very quick. You're going to have to stand there a little bit longer to try to burn down brick. And it's still yeah, that'll a preach. That'll so, preach there, man. I'm gonna when when you look at the the philosophy of Booker T. Washington, learning to do by doing, you know we're jumping in it and we're gonna do the work, and in the process we're gonna figure it out. And in Tuskegee, we started as a normal school for colored teachers. Then we went on to to the industrial trades, but we always have been about educating the masses. So everybody who comes out of Tuskegee is a teacher. 
because we understand that we have to send you out into your community so that you can teach the masses. And no matter what resources that are given to you, we're going to teach you how to turn those resources into something productive. So, you know, I think it's important that, you know, while we have the conversation that continues to raise our consciousness about the fight that we're in and constantly in, I think it's also important for us to look at the work that we've consistently done as a people to not only stay a, a, alive, to thrive, to build community. You know, if you look at the Tuskegee Rosenwald Community School Building Program, where we built schools from 1900 through 1940, you want to talk about building community? Now you got 5,000 schools that were built from North Carolina all the way to Texas in rural communities. You know, if you want to talk about outreach and building ourselves, Tuskegee, through the establishment of the Cooperative Extension Program, was able to take that knowledge through the movable, the Jessup Wagon and the movable school out into the community because they said, you know what, we're not going to reach everybody who comes to our ca campus because they can't. So we got to take it to the people. We talk about curriculum. If we're going to design curriculum, we're not here to design curriculum that talks about Latin, no offense to Latin, but when you're talking about a community that's sitting here trying to figure out how to get off the, you know, get out of the sharecropping system, you know, e pluribus unum ain't going to make me grow any crops any faster. But if we take our right. curriculum right. and we tailor it to the needs of the people in the communities where they are, then we can teach them how you can de develop an, e an economy with the resources that you have. We can teach them yeah. how you address the needs of, of your particular community. So the fact when we throw out stats that talk about African Americans are, say, are ranking high when it comes to high blood pressure or, or heart disease or anything else, part of that is because we ain't got curriculum that's designed to address our needs where they are. And then and the other the part, question. yeah, I mean, just that's please, the question. The other, the other part is the fact that you have all these other components that we started the conversation with. When you have images that tell you that you're a second class citizen, 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 yet you know you first class with the work that you do, there's a there's there's a battle inside as you're trying to deal with that. When you drive right. in communities where you know for a fact when you pass a cop, he's not there to protect you, he's there to police you, and you got to worry whether or not you're gonna make it home alive. Well, that that I mean, your cortisol levels will go high, your high blood pressure is gonna hit the roof, your stress is gonna be there, your cholesterol is gonna be there. So when you establish environments that are designed to kill you and you wonder why folks are dying, that's why our institutions are here. So we can teach you how to survive within these environments and we create the curriculums that make it happen. Dr. White, did you have, I, I, I heard a couple of times you maybe wanted to, to weigh in on that. Did you have something you wanted to say before we moved on to our next question? Well, I'm 50 years old, right? And my generation, is probably the sorriest bunch of Africans that we've ever had. And I say that purely because of the battle that has taken place and is still taking place between what uh, the late Dr. Gwen Patton called transactional Negroes versus transforming Negroes. Meaning, are we teaching people to make money and or hustle or establish personal gain or are we actually doing the community outreach? I'm not talking about in the past, I'm talking about now. Right? And so when it's time for us to talk about those transformative things, right, that take place, it is very difficult to establish the models that are necessary because half the folk who are in leadership positions don't even know what you're talking about. See, they themselves were not educated to the point of conviction, mm -hmm. you see, to even put into practice what was being done in the past. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I criticize my generation is because I find myself having to try to re-educate my peers, some of whom are in very powerful positions, over stuff that they claim they got when they went to a HBCU. Obviously, they didn't get it. And let me give you some examples. Now, some of the observations that have been made in a social science perspective from Alabama State University and other schools, uh, Dr. Lawrence Reddick, who was Dr. King's sponsor when he came to Alabama State to do his doctoral work, and other people from SNCC on down stressed 
establishing the relationship between Africans and African-Americans. One of the major academic hubs has always been to unite the diaspora, right? Tuskegee has a sister school in Liberia, right? And them folks have been begging and asking for help for years. They didn't even know it was over there, right. you see? And so when we when it's time for us to do the break, back breaking work, the grunt work to get it done, the desire falls off. Now, when it's time to deliver a paper or publish a book or go on CNN and do all that high profile stuff, then that's right. Yeah, you're going to get that. But when it's time to actually lay the foundation, you know, or to not the foundation, but the platform to actually rebuild, you know, from the knowledge that we have in the past, the desire falls off, you see? And so when I look at the emphasis of my peers, you see, rebuilding the African-American self-determination model, you know, that which Harold Cruz and uh, Crisis of the Negro Intellectual said we did not establish, when it's time to finish that, man, you can't get people to buy into that. You know, you can get into the conversation, but when you talk about action and activism and actually getting those things done, the desire, the platform for it falls off with the fraternities and the sororities. It falls off at the churches. It falls off at the, so even with the Black Lives Matter stuff, they're not going to address the self-determinative measures that push us and make for an advancing people. You see, when it's time to talk about uh, our relationship uh, with the African diaspora or even the relationship that the black man and the black woman have together, you see, we can approach it from a Dr. Phil standpoint, but when it's time to uh, uh, deal with it academically, you'll have gender studies, you'll have ethnic studies, you. but where that is the class on how a black man treat a black woman. Historically, you see, those serious mm -hmm. fundamental issues that we could uh, address, in my, this is just in my opinion, you see what I'm saying? We need a major push, but it's a moral one, right? We need to have all the black faculty together, lock yeah. us up in a giant stadium somewhere, and, and we just need to have us a come to Jesus meeting, and just because you're from a high-profile high, a high profile HBCU, that gives you no more authority, no more rank than somebody that come from a school that's just hanging on because we all basically uh, are in the same boat. I know the struggles that Dr. Fluka and Dr. Tolan had at Tuskegee. I know that because I was there. And so the issue was, it, it was and it is now, what we're teaching. You see, when you start teaching Negroes self-determination, you are going to run into a problem. Because well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me jump in real quick, uh, Dr. Daniels, before you before you uh, chime in on that. Because what I'm hearing here is, is that um, is nation building. And so mm -hmm. basically what you're talking about is nation building. And, and, and you're talking about how we take some of the some of the examples that we've had in our past. They have done great things like Tuskegee University, Booker T. Washington, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey, um, you know, these individuals who were who were nation builders. Um, and we kind of just missed the mark and we missed the point. And I, and I see what you're saying, Dr. White, is that our, our ideas and our thoughts and stuff have been redirected to um, to activities and actions that really have no 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 no, no forward movement. Right. They're, they're activities that are surface level, but are not properly building um this nation that you know african americans what i like to call black people we we are our own nation within a nation you know and the, and the whole aspect of pan-africanism or was to unite the diaspora and, I, and i'm with you on that and so what i'm hearing is that it's some nation building that we need going on where we're all on one accord where we have the curriculum you know, we, we've developed the curriculum we're doing the things um that we know is gonna affect and benefit us um, to help kind of move this this dial forward for black people. Now, uh, Dr. Daniels, I'm gonna go ahead and let you weigh in. And then we got two more questions, um, and then we'll start to close up. But go ahead. So I I'll speak about some of the work we're doing at Tuskegee right now, um, and it, it, it's partly rooted in what Dr. White stated. Um, we have to figure out how to get into our communities and address the needs of our communities. 
But the work that we've been doing is really grounded in the work of the past. And so I say in the past, not for the, not for the sake of saying, you know, uh, that's what they did and we lived there. You know, we have sometimes we, we spend too much time living in the past and not contributing to the narrative. What I say is that let's look at what they did. When you think about a place like Mountain Bayou, Mississippi, you know, one of the, one of the first incorporated African-American towns, or you look at Tuskegee in the Greenwood community, that was a model for how black communities were supposed to be built all over the country. And you get Eatonville, you get Grambling, you get Voorhees, you know, you get all these spaces and you're like, how did that happen? Well, when you say that these folks walked into a, basically a forested area, they started chopping down trees and then they built their buildings, they built their infrastructure, they built the, the streets. Real talk, I walk into any community now, I'm like, man, yo, this is light work, bro. You know what I mean? Well, we gotta put it in, a, we gotta couch it in a, in, a, in a position that you can see it as light work. Otherwise you're like, oh, we gotta right. find some money. Well, listen, these brothers ain't, and sisters ain't find no money when it came to just getting down and doing the work. You know, if they, you know, if they built in the images you see behind me, this is what I look at every day of students coming together and building the roads. And when you hear Dr. Washington talk about the method, folks wasn't trying to get down and do the dirt, you know, get, get you know, get dirty and do the work. But when you say, you know, I'm a leader and as a leader, I have to be an example and I have to demonstrate, I ain't got no problem rolling up my sleeves. You know, we can talk after we do the work. And so finding ways to tie the curriculum, we're building a historic preservation program at Tuskegee for two reasons. We got a, we got a campus that got buildings that need to be preserved. Right. And in our community, all over from Birmingham to Selma to Montgomery, to Tuskegee and all points in between, we got African-American communities that got stories to be preserved and saved. And so if we can take a curriculum of architecture, if we can take the curriculum of history and literally just do what Dr. Washington did and tie that curriculum to doing the work that's needed, then we can have some, you know, we can have these conversations. We can have some fun and kick back and, you know, at 10 o'clock at night after we spend a whole day doing the work. Right. Because the work is done. I I, I agree. Um, Just just to um start summing up, um, you know, we <laughs> this conversation has is it, it really has just um, re really gone past the the vision that I have for it. And, and you all and you two gentlemen have been um, totally dynamic. Everything you're saying is on point. Um, but these last couple of questions, I just want to kind of we're going to have to go through a little a little quickly. But we talked about HBCUs a lot um, today, and I, di I didn't really think that that was going to be um, a, a part of our our um, our target um content that we were thinking about um when i when i came up with these questions and everything but i did have a question about um where you see these cultural spaces that are that are that are geared towards a, a certain demographic or a certain group um like chinatown little italy you know little tokyo things of that nature and even you know hbcus can be considered a space that is you know um for a particular demographic of the population i remember when i'm not going to date myself but i remember when i was coming in as a freshman at xavier um, there was a, a a national conversation about getting rid of HBCUs because they figured that was something that was segregating uh, um, black populations and black students from from you know, what we call predominantly white institutions or from those other big type schools. So how important do you think it is to have cultural spaces that are unique to a particular group or demographic or background? Yeah, I think it's super important. But understand that the entire the HBCU community was created for such exactly. and academically like at alabama state you know historically when you look at even the role that african alumni played you know uh i call nigeria you know little asu because you know we've got so many people that have that have graduated and uh it's time for us to continue the, the 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 challenge and the struggle to document our history, teach our history. Some of my colleagues and I am going to ask Dr. Daniels to write a chapter uh, for our next book, Highway 80, uh, March Through Alabama Civil Rights Corridor. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing is we're using GIS mm -hmm. to tell the story of civil rights throughout the Black Belt, mm -hmm. and that's 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 mm -hmm. what. And, and that's what our faculty are doing. And, and that's what I'm gonna ask Dr. Daniels to do and others. We've got 
a whole, there is so much work to be done. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it, our kids that go to schools a stone's throw away from Tuskegee or Alabama State or Howard or that school up there in Huntsville, we ain't gonna mention that name. They should be able. <laughs> I got some AM people watching up there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, kids, the, kids, the kids should be able to at least embrace the history and be co ambassadors of the history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But see, here's the question where is the desire to build or maintain those partnerships between? the classroom at the HBCU and the classroom at the elementary and at the middle school and at the high school. Where is the continuity? You know, every semester I have students that want me to write letters of recommendation for them to join frats and sororities. And what I do is I tell them that I'm not gonna write you a letter of recommendation until you tell me how your membership in that organization will help people who will never qualify to be a member of that organization. Wow. How is your membership in that group going to help people who will probably never be accepted by that group as being a member? Because when we began to think revolutionary, we began to look at those people who are the most vulnerable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and begin with them. Booker T. Washington was a master organizer but he knew how to mobilize. Mm -hmm. And so his ability to mobilize local talent and to get people who probably would not and could not attend the school to actually build a darn thing. See, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. But where is the comparable work, mm -hmm. you see, being done? Because we only focus on the graduate and not the impact the graduate is going to make on people who will not graduate mm -hmm. or those people who are, as the Bible said, the least of these, my brother. So we publish books. We do lectures and speeches. And I'm talking about going into the sticks now. I'm mm -hmm. talking about going into, I mean, you know, we going into places to have these conversations with people because mm -hmm. the Montgomery bus boycott, ASU people, and most of the faculty, and I'm just going to throw out some names, Mary Francis Burke, Thelma Glass, uh, 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 Joanne Robinson. All of these people got fired, man. Mm -hmm. They got fired from the HBCU for doing the boycott. Mm -hmm. You see? So that's why I'm saying that historically there has always been a battle. And that is between the activists, you see, the revolutionary and the administrative situation, which operates totally against it. And so that's what I want to address. I want to address the rift, the schism, the division that is going on and has been for a while that actually keeps us from doing the significant outreach, you see, that's necessary to impact. Because with other, I'm going to talk with Dr. Daniels after this over, hopefully, because <laughs> there's some other schools, white schools, that are, are spending millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. hundreds of millions to re research our stuff. You see? And the question is, what are they going to do with it? And who's going to benefit? Organize ourselves. And the strategy that we're going to create is going to be one to where we win the war in the classroom. Right? Mm -hmm. Because the classroom, winning the war in the classroom is the key to our liberation. So God bless y'all, Black Power, and whatever I can do to help, I do it. Brother Daniels, you want me to come and help you sweep, clean up, do whatever hey, I do it. it? Let's get it, brother. <laughs> All right. right. Let's get it. All right. Um, last last question really quickly. Um, you know, we talked about kind of a little bit of the history of spaces where Blacks were not allowed or where they were where they were forced to have to um, um sit in a certain place or or going through the back or 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 view the show from the balcony or um you know whatever the case may be um and so and, and we talked a little bit about how you know other other groups have their spaces and how you know that's rightfully so they should have their spaces and everybody should be able to have a place where they're comfortable that that reflects their culture and their interested interest and in, in things of that nature but this last question is, is to me is do you believe that these groups 
should have to open up uh, their spaces to other groups. You know, they, they still say that Sunday is the most segregated day of the week. Um, and that's because of the fact that, you know, most people worship with people who look like them, um, you know, or, or they worship in their own neighborhoods. And, you know, and those, those neighborhoods are reflective of, um, of, how, of how they look. And so using that cliche um, quote, should people have to open up their spaces to other people? Well, I'll say I'll say I'll answer it like this. Um, and it, it's part of that conversation about the role of an HBCU and its value. HBCUs have never turned themselves, have never closed themselves off from anybody participating. That is true. So, you know, Dr. White spoke about the violence that's associated with racism. You take out the violence, there's no issue. You understand? Hmm. I mean, when we talk about the use of, 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 of you know racism in this country, we it's not about the words, it's about it's not about the you know not allowing somebody in. It's the violence that comes along with it. You know, if you if you look at my space, I'm going to kill you. If you come in my space, I'm going to kill you. If you if you walk past me, if I see you, I'm going to kill you. That's the problem. It is not the whether you open it up or not open it up. You know, having a water fountain that's for me and a water fountain's for you. That's, you know, it's not about the water fountain. It's the fact that the one I'm drinking out of is that one full of lead and yours is one that's purified. You know, are you using this as a method to kill me versus yours is one to provide health to you? You know, is it the fact that my neighborhood, our neighborhoods are being segregated? It's not that, OK, black people are on this side of town and white people are on that side of town. It's the fact that the educational system on my side of town is horrible. Because food in my neighborhood is horrible. It ain't food. Come on, man. That ain't food. food does, the water, yeah. the drink, all that is horrible. The streets are worse. It's more expensive to live in a poor neighborhood than it is to live in, a, in an affluent neighborhood because of the quality of the space that we're in. So when we talk about spaces not being open to everybody, the argument is honestly not saying, oh, you got to let me in your environment. All I'm saying is, come on, dude, I'm just living in. Uh, you know, I'm living in a, in a in a toxic waste cesspool and I want to get out no different than anybody else who would be living in this environment. No different than you would want to get out. I'm honestly not saying I want to run to where you are. I'm just like the water that you're drinking from. I can tell it's healthy and the water I'm drinking from is not the store you're shopping from. It smells clean. And the one that I'm shopping from smells like death. Like, come on now. So yeah. when we talk about these spaces and these environments, it ain't about saying, oh, we have to totally integrate and come together, sing Kumbaya. That's that's a low level. That's a mundane conversation. And if we stay on that level, then we will continue to be about, oh, open this up and don't. Nah, it's saying stop taking resources and decreasing the quality because the color of my skin is not the color of yours. You know, right. because, because of the characters that I have. And that's truly not just black. When you look at Little Italy or you look at Chinatown or you look at any one of these other spaces, they will argue the exact same point. When I come into your environment, don't treat me like I'm less than that what's on the bottom of your shoe. Brother, I'm a human being just like you. You're a human being. And if we need to prove it, we're going to prove it. And so that means if I got to stand in front of your place to show you, I'm going to do that. And if I got to take it to some other levels, I'm going to make sure I'm going to do what I got to do to help you understand that me. I'm a human being, you, you a human being. And as Dr. King said, if we all agree that there's this thing called agape love, there's this inherent uh, 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 connection between all of us because this is God force energy that God put in every single one of us. And you got that God force energy, just like I got this God force energy. And our God force energies, we're going to have a conversation about how we need to understand that we come from the same place. But if you deem that your place is better than mine and you're going to bring forces to make sure not only do I not come to your space, but you're going to come at my space and you're going to try to destroy me. That's a whole nother conversation. And that's the piece that ever across the world folk fight against that because that that just ain't right. And we're going to, you know, and yeah. we're going to do work that's necessary to elevate within within these spaces and, and change those paradigms. So, you know, again, the question about whether your space should stay segregated. I, 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 I rephrase it because it's not about your space being segregated. It's about the work that you do to say, not only can I not come to your space, but the work that you do to destroy me in my space. Mm -hmm. And that right there, that's 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 not acceptable. 
Yeah. Wow, powerful, powerful. Um, Dr. White. Yeah. I'm gonna ask Very you for a, a a short closing remark as we get up yeah. out of here. Sure. Yeah, two things. One, we have to look at the uh the worldview of the faculty and the worldview of the students. And then we have to look at the demographic of who it is that we're trying to reach. And the faculty have to be, have to have a firm understanding of the realities of the demographic that we're trying to reach. And they also, in my opinion, should have some track record of being successful at implementing into the community of the demographic workable <laughs> means of sustainability, which means that in order for you to come to an HBCU, be successful, get faculty, get tenure, get whatever, you will have had to have shown some aptitude in dealing with the demographic of the people without being ashamed of them, without trying to tr change them, without trying to reinterpret them or have some messiah complex or something, is that when you have an understanding, an epistemological understanding of the events and circumstances that have shaped their environment, you're not ashamed of them. As a matter of fact, you'll find out that they're actually your family. Mm -hmm. So we have to revive and reteach and re-preach and re-evangelize our people, in my opinion, on the importance. And everybody who comes to the HBCU, if you want to feel comfortable and you want to be accepted, you will have to have been able to buy into the theme and the and the platform and the worldview that existed decades, if not centuries, before you even got there. So thank y'all so much. Uh, thank you. I thank you, brother, so much. I hope you all link up behind the scenes. I, I can see you all doing some powerful things together. Um, I thank you for all the uh, information that you all gave us today. Um, I learned a lot, um, and I and and I gained um, not only a mode of insight, but also some inspiration and some motivation about how we really need to solve the issues that are occurring in the black community. Um, and we all know that they're all connected and they all um, are residual from something else um, that, that occurred in our history. And so I just thank you brothers. Um, please um, look out for these gentlemen. I know they're gonna be doing bigger and, and, and better things. So, so keep an eye out on them. Um, please stay connected to our website, www.bcri.org. Um, next Thursday at the same time, we will have a presentation on uh, black mental health matters, um, how to deal with stress, anxiety, depression, um, and also living through a pandemic. And so please um, stay connected to the Institute. Um, please donate if, you, if you're if you able. Um, it, it, it helps us to continue to do the things that we're doing um, every day. And so I just want to say thank you all and have a good rest of your day.